evening. I want to welcome everyone tonight to our very special talk we have for you. My name is Stephanie Sandoval and I'm the Public Archaeology Director at the San Diego Archaeological Center. Um, we are a nonprofit dedicated to preserving local archaeological collections. In addition to our curation facility, we also have a museum and offer adult and, ed and children's educational programming. Uh, if you want more information on the center, please visit our website, or if you are interested in becoming a member or making a donation or our upcoming events, all of that is there as well. Um, we have two events scheduled for July. Our first one is a case study on bleach bottles found at the Whaley House um, by Kathy Collins, and then 10,000 Years, the Archaeological Record of San Diego by our director, Cindy Stankowski. So look for those both in July. Tonight, we're going to be using the Q&A feature. So if you have a question, please type your, um, your question into the Q&A, and then they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Um, I am very pleased to introduce tonight um, Dr. Philip Kaczynski. He has been a wonderful supporter of the San Diego Archaeological Center for many years. For almost 50 years, he worked as a pediatric infectious disease specialist and reached the rank of captain in the United States Navy Medical Corps. He is a very prolific author on various topics and draws from on his wide range of interests from biology to anthropology um, in developing his Better Life seminars. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over and enjoy the presentation. Well, thank you. Okay, uh, let me pull up my uh, PowerPoint. Now that's interesting, it did not come up there. Oh, here we go. Take just a couple seconds to open. And I think we're in business. So thank you all for participating in this. This is a fascinating topic. And a lot of people know a lot about ancient Egypt, but I'm taking a slightly different view of things in this presentation and sharing some medical aspects of ancient Egypt, which are not generally very well known. If we look at what Egypt is like, this map shows the main features of the country. And you'll see what looks like a discrepancy. There's at the shore of the Mediterranean, there is lower Egypt. And farther down is upper Egypt. And that refers simply to the upper or lower portions of the Nile. And has nothing to do with the geographic orientation. There are several reasons why ancient Egypt was a very unique civilization. One is that it's a very ancient one. It arose about 6,000 years ago. And for about 3,500 years, the uh, Egyptian empire was pretty well isolated. And it was surrounded by desert. It was self-sufficient because of the bounty of the Nile. Uh, but they didn't have to depend on other cultures in order to maintain their own culture. One of the things that was interesting about them was that until the Hyksos tribes invaded that area, and later the Greeks and the Romans, uh, they had no competition. And so not only did they not have very much in the way of competition, but they didn't have very much input either from other cultures, so that they were very self-oriented in everything that they did. When we look at the time frame, we find that for nearly 4,000 years, the politics and the social structure and the agriculture and art were essentially unchanged, which is very unusual for most civilizations, especially when you contrast that with Western civilization, because from about 500 BC, there have been some remarkable changes in our civilization. And even from 1500 on, you can appreciate what the differences have occurred. 
it, the only culture I can think of that might be somewhat uh, akin to that relatively unchanging culture is Chinese culture during that time. Climate had a lot to do with the way the Egyptians' uh, culture developed. For one thing, it's obviously a very dry area. And the average rainfall, if we go to the area south of the Mediterranean coast, uh, was less than about eight inches per year. And what that meant was that the soil does not support extensive microbial growth for the decomposition of biological materials. And I mention this because when we think about mummies, and of course mummies are one of the first uh, subjects that come to mind when we talk about ancient Egypt, uh, we find that possibly mummification arose because they were aware that in that climate, and if they were away from the Nile River, uh, things pretty much lasted forever and si didn't simply decay. Now, one of the reasons that we know so much about them was they had some way to record it. They had an abundant paper supply because, as you know, uh, the paper that was used in Egypt was known as papyrus, and it came from a plant that grew plentifully in the Nile Valley. Another factor was that recording everything about them was considered important, and that especially included tax records. And as you might imagine, tax records can tell you a great deal about the, how a society works. Another factor was that scribes were held in very high regard. In some civilizations like, uh, like ours, for instance, uh, people who go into academia or the professions are held in high regard. And I would guess that when a little boy was growing up, and of course they were almost always men, moms would tell their sons, if you study hard, you're gonna someday be a scribe and you might become famous. And in fact, some of them did. I'm sure that many people in this audience know exactly what this is. This is a Rosetta Stone. And it is now at the London Museum. And what is on display at the museum is not the actual stone itself, but a, uh, a very exact duplicate. Three sections of script in this block of stone. And uh, it was the key to understanding the hieroglyphics that we now know are so abundant. And uh, this guy is saying, Rosetta, what's that stone you're working on? Well, it's not named after a young woman named Rosetta. Rosetta was an area in Egypt where the stone was found. The stone was commissioned by a pharaoh in 196 BC. And it was discovered by one of Napoleon's officers in 1799 when Napoleon invaded Egypt. This was not an accidental discovery because Napoleon had an intense uh, interest in ancient Egypt and that included a scientific interest, an academic interest, so he brought with him literally a couple of hundred scientists to Egypt to study that country. And what they found on this stone was those three texts that you saw one was in Egyptian hieroglyphics, which until that time were never deciphered. The second was in Demotic, which is a common Egyptian language of the time. And the third was ancient Greek. And of course he had within his, his cadre, a number of people who were quite fluent in the several variants of the Greek language. And the stone text actually describes a little bit of the braggadocio of Ptolemy V. He describes the gifts and the accomplishments that he was able to make on behalf of his people. And obviously politics hasn't changed much in the last couple thousand years. When we look at the kind of art that we discover throughout Egypt, we find that the style, as I mentioned earlier, was virtually unchanged throughout the entire history of the ancient Egyptian culture and it proliferated in tombs and temples. So when I say proliferated, uh, that is a, tomb, uh, a term that I use uh, very carefully because every square inch is seen of uh, the walls and the ceilings of the tombs and temples that were discovered over the last couple of thousand years or so were entirely decorated with those paintings. And they described almost every facet of Egyptian life. This is one example. 
And this is a, an example of someone in his field driving a, um, a um, domestic uh, form of cattle that they had at that time. And behind him is his wife. It looks like she's bringing him lunch. Well, things haven't changed much because until fairly recently, farmers' wives did bring their lunch out to them in the fields. And so that is a long story tradition. This scene depicts a fishing hunting party and you see the royalty there, the tallest figures, who are uh, wielding weapons of the time. The one on the right is spearing a couple of fish. The one on the left is uh, wielding a throwing stick to possibly bring down a bird. And of course, you see a couple of the half-dressed or undressed people in those uh, boats. And uh, they are, of course, the slaves who looked after uh, their masters. This is a couple of royal uh, women, probably princesses, maybe daughters or relatives of the pharaoh, who are playing a board game. And isn't it fascinating that that board looks just like a modern day chess board or checkerboard? So again, things haven't changed much over a couple thousand years. This series shows the kinds of activity that occurred in agriculture in Egyptian life. And they show, for instance, the gathering of uh, grain, uh, the carriage of grain, uh, probably back to wherever it's being processed, uh, and other facets of uh, farm life in, in that time. And this is an example of a tomb in which, you, as I mentioned, virtually every square inch of uh, the walls and the ceilings are covered uh, with artwork depicting the various uh, scenes that occur in ancient Egypt. And this, of course, shows girls' night out. Uh, these girls are ed being entertained by a couple of slave girls who are doing the dancing, and uh, uh, I guess this is the kind of thing that you might see in any big city these days, like Las Vegas, uh, from the ones on the left all in their fancy finery to the ones on the right who just have no finery at all. Well, you might have noticed about all of the figures that are shown in the last several slides. And that is that in several thousand images that you can go through if you go into the internet, no one is obese or even overweight in that culture that covers literally uh, a couple of thousand years. <clears throat> well, the first great physician in Egypt was named Imhotep. He is uh, known as the father of Egyptian medicine. He was an actual person, <coughs> and he was raised to, uh, to the level of a god, lived about 2650 BC, and he was truly what we would now call a Renaissance man. He was an engineer, he was a sculptor, he was an administrator and a physician. And he was the person who is credited with having designed the first major pyramid in Egypt known as the Step Pyramid. And as you can see from this photograph, why it was called the Step Pyramid, it was certainly a much uh, a different form than the kinds of uh, great pyramids that we see in, uh, from ancient Egypt now. Uh, but the basic uh, elements of the structure were the same. Well, they had a, there was a mixed medical bag among Egyptian physicians. And they were held in very high esteem throughout the known world. They were very highly educated. And many of their practices were based not on actual biology, because there were no biological sciences in those days. But they were based on what they did know, which was their ideas of religion and the gods and evil spirits and various rituals. And we know from various writings of the day that they utilized hundreds of different kinds of plant products and it turns out that a number of them had genuine benefit. And as a matter of fact, some of them are still being used today, as we'll see in a couple of minutes. One of the things that they did discover was that there were certain practices uh, that the public needed to maintain in order to stay healthy. And what they did was they determined what the best practices were. And instead of simply telling people how to conduct their life and how to conduct uh, the way they disposed of waste, for instance, uh, was not based on medicine, of which there was none, really, but they were based on religion. 
And when they say, well, we doctors think you ought to do something to stay healthy, the public would probably ignore it. But if they say the gods tell you to do these things to stay healthy, they probably towed the line and did those things. They made some contributions to medicine in uh, those three or 4,000 years. It may be that they were the first to use splints in the man management of bone fractures. And obviously, fractures were probably even more common in those days because of primitive tools than they are today. So, and because of warfare as well, they learned how to handle bone fractures pretty well. An interesting thing that's been noted in a number of cultures, including this one, is they were able to treat depressed skull fractures. How um, well those patients survived, we really don't know, but they did know that in order to prevent uh, the person from dying, they had to lift the fragments of the fracture out and restore the integrity of the skull. They also used sutures to close wounds. And I would imagine that they probably had a variety of kinds of uh, materials to use, maybe from plant materials or maybe from some sort of uh, cloth structures, but they were adept at doing that as well. Something that they found back then was that they could prevent wounds from becoming infected by using honey. And that is exactly what we have used even in the 21st century, certainly throughout the 20th century and earlier, to prevent wounds from becoming infected and by simply pouring honey into a wound, that meant that water could enter because there is very little actual water in honey. It's a, it's a very concentrated material and it has some antibacterial properties and wounds really did heal better when they covered them in honey. They also learned that they could stop bleeding by applying a hot knife blade to blood vessels to literally burn the vessels, to scar them down, to keep the vessels from uh, oozing blood. Now, obviously from major vessels that didn't work, but certainly from many kinds of injuries that they saw from a sore. That kind of technique worked pretty well. Well, this it kind of epitomizes what people think of when they think of ancient Egypt. And you're probably wondering who the actor was who played the mummy back in the 1930s. And you're probably thinking that it was a guy named Boris Karloff. Well, the name of that actor was actually William Henry Pratt, whose stage name was Boris Karloff. And if you wonder why that happened, it's because at the turn of the uh, 18th to the 19th uh, century, Actors had a very bad reputation. William Henry Pratt came from a relatively wealthy family of people in the financial business. And he realized that if he became an actor and used his fam family name, it would bring dishonor upon his family. So he changed his name to Boris Karloff. And to this day, no one knows how he came up with the name Boris Karloff. The year was 1932, and it brings me to how I met your mummy. Well, the word mummy uh, is, has two possible origins. The Arabic word uh, is similar to the word for embalmed corpse, which to me makes the most sense. However, there is also a phrase in the Persian language um, that is similar to mummy, and that refers to asphalt or crude oil, and it may have referred to a tar-like preparation, <clears throat> the resin that they used to coat the mummy. As I mentioned very early when I talked about the climate in Egypt, probably there were instances where they found bodies that had been mummified naturally in the hot sand of the desert. And that has sort of occurred throughout the world. There are natural mummies, for instance, in the Altiplano of South America. And there is our mummification practices among those people probably originating from that natural event as well. And one of the things about the mummies that we call anthropogenic mummies, the ones that were actually constructed by people, was they conformed to the religious belief in the afterlife. And it was felt 
by the ancient Egyptians that after we died, at some point, we would come back to life and re-inhabit our bodies. And in order to preserve, it, to preserve them as well as possible, they used the mummification technique. Well, this technique called mummology was done by a specific group of technicians, uh, what we now would consider embalmers. And they were not physicians, but obviously because they handled many, many bodies, they got to know anatomy very well. And they actually uh, thought that the brain was useless. So they took it out by puncturing uh, a bone called a cribriform plate at the base of the skull by sticking a sharp instrument up through the nose, puncturing that relatively thin bony plate and then uh, sucking the, uh, the brain out. And I guess the lowest technician in the totem pole got that job. So what they also did was they removed the abdominal contents through a very small incision in the flank. And I mentioned that because what that meant was they had to know what they were doing. They had to know the location of the various contents of the abdomen in order to remove them carefully through that small incision. And then they, when they removed those viscera, except for the brains they discarded, they stored them in what are called canopic jars. And then they, they took the rest of the corpse and they covered it, they buried it in a salt-like material called natron to preserve it and dehydrate it. And they did that for at least 40 days and for as long as 70 days. And the richer you were, the longer your body was preserved in natron. Then they wrapped the corpse in linen, and that's the figure that we see in uh, movies and etc. And they covered the whole thing in resin to hold everything together. And these jars are what are called canopic jars. The word canopic is uh, related to a, uh, an area in Egypt called canopus. And each of those jars has a different set of contents and they were identified by the, uh, by the cap that you can see here. It has a lot of value to us today. And one would think that it helped physicians of the day to learn rudimentary anatomy and to some extent it did, but actually the mummologists and the physicians didn't really spend a lot of time sharing information. The true value of the mummy was discovered in the 20th century when we developed the kinds of tools that we could use to examine mummies without literally taking them apart. And the first ones, of course, were x-rays, then we had CAT scans, uh, MRIs, and finally DNA analysis, which has produced an incredible wealth of information of what those people were like. Well, this is kind of the crux of this presentation. We'll talk about the diseases of, era, of the era. And what they find, for example, is that smallpox was one of those diseases which apparently was present at that time because Ramses V, uh, when his mummy was uh, uncovered, it turned out that he had lesions on his face which were the classic scars of smallpox. Now, could have been some other infection, but we do know that that kind of infection occurs at that time. We also know that they had tuberculosis back then. And what, they, uh, we, what we were able to find was that they had evidence of what's called bovine tuberculosis, not the human kind. The reason we know it was bovine was because bovine TB causes classic bone lesions and bovine tuberculosis is very common among domestic animals in primitive societies. Uh, the human tuberculosis, as you probably know, involves primarily the lungs. Well, the lungs were not well preserved back then, so we don't really have good evidence that they had the kind of tuberculosis that ravaged, uh, civilized the society up until only about 60 or so years ago. And the way that they acquired bovine tuberculosis was from contaminated milk. We still see that in developing countries, especially from something called soft cheese. Soft cheese uh, has a number of contaminants, one of which is bovine tuberculosis. They had a lot of parasites. And because their sewage systems, their drainage systems, and their water supplies uh, were not very sophisticated, they were 
are often uh, plagued by various kinds of parasites. Now, in one sense, uh, that was good because we need parasites really to have good health. And I'll comment on that. Malaria was very common back then. Of course, the area around the, uh, the Nile uh, River was often very swampy as the river receded, and it was a breeding ground for mosquitoes that transmit malaria. Now, we know that uh, the men of the day had prostate cancer, and the reason we know that is because that particular kind of cancer produces very characteristic uh, changes in the bone when it spreads to the skeleton. And so we know that prostate cancer was prevalent in those days as well. But certainly malnutrition was very common. Uh, not probably among the, uh, the more sophisticated people, the aristocrats and the rulers of the day. But we know that scurvy was common in those days and that anemia was very common in those days uh, because the kind of anemia that they had was a kind that is still highly prevalent around the world today in developing countries. It's likely that they had a disease called plague that has been described in some of the uh, papers that I'll, I'll mention. They probably also had a leprosy. And there, we're not really sure whether it's the kind of leprosy that was described in the Bible, but probably something very similar. Certainly they have some diseases like us. We know from studies of some of those mem uh, mummies that they had appendicitis. They also had something called ankylosing spondylitis. This is a rheumatism type of disease that occurs in the spinal column, the vertebral column. And it was common in those days, maybe because of some genetic factors. Now, it's interesting that using very highly sophisticated technology of today, uh, this is being reclassified as a different type of arthritis, but it's something that was prevalent in that time. Malaria, as I mentioned, was very common. As a matter of fact, there were four different types of malaria. We know that cancer was present as well because of uh, my comments regarding prostate cancer. And something that was common in that population was something called achondroplastic dwarfism. And if you wonder what achondroplastic dwarfism is like, this is an example. Uh, these are actually the uh, actors that were portrayed in The Wizard of Oz. These were the munchkins. And there were a number of them. There are a lot of stories about the munchkins. Some of you may be aware of them. And they were not midgets. They were not simply small bodies, but their bodies were unusual because their arms and the legs were very short. And as you can see, their heads were pretty much normal size. And the torso, was almost normal size. And what made them so small was that their legs were so short. I mentioned malaria a couple of times, and certainly it's still a problem. Malaria is caused by a parasite, the malaria parasite, that invades and destroys red blood cells. And there are four basic types. Some of them are uh, very mild, and one of them is a severely uh, a severe disease, which even now accounts for literally hundreds of thousands of, of fatalities in developing countries and the tropics on a regular basis. The name mal malaria comes from the uh, Italian word mala aria, which was uh, felt to be the source of the disease. They didn't realize that mosquitoes carried malaria. They thought it came from bad air. And you can understand why when, if you know anything about swamps, if you have ever lived in an area, especially in the southeastern United States, where there are a lot of swamps, you might recognize the fact that every once in a while as you're driving past the swamp, you'll see what well, looks like a little cloud puffing up uh, from the swamp. And this is a gas that's, rele that's released from decaying matter in the swamp. And since people knew that the ones who lived near swamps were the ones most likely to get malaria, and that these little clouds of this strange uh, smoke came out of the swamp, that's what caused the disease. But clearly that was not what the case was. Well, isn't this an interesting phrase? Watch the guy with the cane. 
And here's why. One of the complications of malaria, especially the really chronic types, is that it causes the spleen to enlarge. The spleen is an organ about the size of your fist in the normal state. And it sits on the left side of the chest, protected by the ribs. However, in malaria and certain other diseases, when the spleen enlarges because of that disease, the spleen extends down below the protective rib cage. And it, it, because it's enlarged, it's stretched out and it is fragile. And it was not unusual during uh, certain uh, periods of history, during the Renaissance, this was described, that if you wanted to do away with a, one of your business opponents, for instance, or somebody you just didn't like, then as you are approaching him, as he's walking along the sidewalk, and you are on his left, you walk alongside of him and you give a, a poke, a blow with your cane, that will rupture the spleen and it will be painful, but it won't cause immediate death. The spleen will then bleed out and it will cause a hemorrhage. And we now know that we see that exact situation today. There's a viral disease called infectious mononucleosis, which some of you may know as a kissing disease because it's common in teenagers. It is today the most common cause of spleen injury. And just like malaria, infectious mono causes the spleen to enlarge. And sometimes a person playing football or soccer uh, or some contact sport will be hit by another player. And if that uh, player uh, bumps against the left side of the abdomen, may split the spleen capsule and hemorrhage can result. And several, several people die still every year because of the unrecognized problem of enlarged spleen from infectious mono. When I was in practice and I saw a teenager who came in with infectious mono and I could feel his spleen, it's really pretty easy. Uh, a second grader can feel it. I had that person come back every two weeks until I could no longer feel the spleen, which meant that it had gone back to normal size and was again protected by the rib cage. But I wouldn't let that person play a contact sport until I had checked them out. This is what a malaria parasite looks like. Those six dotted elements are red blood cells that are packed with malaria parasites and they are about to, to split open and spread those dozens of parasites again through the blood cells to invade, to a bloodstream rather, to invade other blood cells. <clears throat> and you can see why the massive destruction of blood cells can lead to anemia, which is one of the main causes of death in malaria. Well, here we have two red blood cells. The one on the left is normal. And he's being kind of nasty saying to the other red blood cell, which is very homely looking, would you look at that face? Well, the red blood cell on the right is distorted by a kind of variant of hemoglobin, which is the protein material that carries oxygen. And because that protein material has an abnormal shape, it forms uh, clusters and crystals which distort the red cell. And instead of being kind of oval as the one on the left, they have what is actually a sickle shape and they form a disease called sickle cell disease, which was very common in Egypt because it's very common throughout Africa. I mentioned that hemoglobin is a protein that carries oxygen within the red cells and there are variants of hemoglobin. The normal variant is called hemoglobin A, which is what almost all of us have. But one variant is called hemoglobin S. S is for sickle. And during that, in the course of that very large protein, a single amino acid is the wrong amino acid and changes the shape of the hemoglobin molecule, which in turn changes the shape of the red cell. And it actually distorts the red cell, which means it can't slip through, red, uh, through blood vessels as easily. <clears throat> 
This especially happens when there is low oxygen tension. And as an example, during World War II, when black military personnel were traveling by plane in non-pressurizing uh, pressurized aircraft, and there was a reduction in the oxygen tension at that uh, elevation, at that altitude, some of their red cells began to crinkle, take on an abnormal shape, would clog blood vessels and cause severe pain and sometimes cause stroke or blindness or other problems. That obstruction to blood vessels can be so severe that it, before you can treat sickle cell disease, a lot of patients with that disorder, <clears throat> there, is a, a, uh, two, there are two variants of the disease, but it was a common cause of death among blacks. The advantage though, as shown in that cartoon, is that that red blood cell, which has that abnormal hemoglobin, is resistant to malaria. And there are many forms of hemoglobin throughout Africa that provide resistance to malaria. And it may have one of those things that evolve so that if you had sickle cell disease, you might survive long enough to propagate, to have a family, and to pass on your genes and avoid malaria. But as I mentioned, a lot of those uh, children died at a very early age. Well, physicians back in Egypt made the diagnosis in a way similar to ours. They took a history by asking questions. They actually did a physical examination, even though they didn't have a very extensive knowledge of anatomy. They looked at body fluids, and the main fluid that they looked at, of course, was urine because it was the most accessible. And then after doing the history and taking, uh, doing a physical examination, looking at the urine, then they would decide <clears throat> what sort of disease the person had. And they would then provide a prescription in one of those herbal preparations that I alluded to earlier. Well, I'm sure everybody on this call knows who this is. This is Tutankhamun, who was known as the Boy King. And he actually died at the age of 19, possibly from malaria. There may have been other problems as well. Interestingly enough, his was one of the few tombs that by the 19th century had not yet been raided by, by, by two robbers who, by the way, didn't wait centuries to open the grave, sometimes within hours of a burial, even of royalty. If that too was not guarded, it would be despoiled. <clears throat> the grave of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922 by an Egyptologist named Howard Carter. And what he found was that there was uh, inbreeding in the Egyptian society among the more affluent and under the ruling uh, class because the royalty wanted to preserve their bloodline. They didn't want to be contaminated with people of lower classes, so they married each other. In fact, King Tut's mother and father were sister and brother, and King Tut's wife was his own half-sister. And so that incestuous marriage, which was very common among the royalty, was associated with a high incidence of congenital defects, and it may be that that affected King Tut as well because he was found to have a partial cleft palate, uh, which is probably genetic. He also had club foot. And again, these were possible results of inbreeding. He also had a poorly developed skeleton. Again, that may have been because of an incestuous relationship. And because he had a fragile skeleton, uh, on one hit, apparently on one of his trips outside his palace, he developed a fracture of the left leg, a compound fracture, which meant bone fractures penetrated the skin, and it may have been that he developed a serious infection, which together with, with the malaria caused his death at the age of 19. He had in fact four different strains of the malaria parasite. This is not unusual among that population. There had been a lot of speculation about other genetic defects that he had. However, our genetic testing is now so, so sophisticated that some of those myths have now been dispelled. Well, the Egyptians had their specialists among their physicians as well. Uh, they had people like a gastroenterologist. As you can imagine, there was a lot of gastrointestinal disease because of the 
kinds of infection that occur because of their primitive sewage system. They had ophthalmologists for a couple of reasons. One is that eyes were damaged by the uh, sandstorms that were common in the area. There was a particular kind of infection called trachoma, a bacterial, it was kind of a bacterium, a disease that is very common and a common cause of blindness in primitive cultures. They did have gynecologists. However, the gynecologists uh, wouldn't dirty their hands with uh, delivering babies. In fact, they had midwives to do that. There were dentists in those days. I can imagine what their dental tools must have been like, but they needed them. They also had another specialist called a guardian or herdsman of the anus, what we would call today a modern day proctologist. You've probably heard of the famous medical papyri that were discovered, especially during the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, that gave us a lot of insight into the kinds of medical issues they had at the time. And those papyri were written in the Demotic script, not hieroglyphic, so they were able to actually uh, translate them. The most famous papyrus is what's called the Abrus papyrus. And Dr. Abrus was an Egyptologist from Germany. He described in that papyrus more than 800 remedies that were used by physicians of that time. Another famous one is the Edwin Smith papyrus. Uh, this was a manual for the military surgeons of the day and described various kinds of surgical problems that the military physician might encounter and more than 700 different kinds of treatments for the kinds of problems that could be encountered in military warfare. There were several other papyri as well, not as well known, but also gave us a lot of information. And this is an example of one of those papyri. And as you can see, this is not hieroglyphics. This is a different kind of script, which we were able to decipher a long time ago. There was another, kind, another form of papyrus as well. And there are literally thousands of these scattered in universities and museums throughout the world. Well, the Egyptian pharmacy was kind of interesting. They had at their disposal literally hundreds of products. They used them either alone or a combination. One of the most common was onions and garlic. They also used things like uh, thyme and dill, sesame, caraway, parsley, the kinds of things that we have pretty much on our, our kitchen, uh, uh, kitchen pantry. But of course, your physician probably doesn't have any of these on his shelf. They used leeches uh, back, uh, we're looking at uh, 3,500 years ago to drain fluids and blood from certain types of injuries. And we're still using leeches today. In my uh, presentation on a day in the life of a Renaissance physician, I give some examples of uh, leech therapy used in those days and today. And this one really puzzles me. They used animal dung to cover wounds. I have no idea what prompted them to do that because they must have had a severe problem with tetanus. Uh, animal uh, dung carries with it the spores and the organism of the bacteria that causes tetanus, what we used to call lockjaw. It's a highly fatal disease. Um, it's very difficult to treat even now. It certainly was a always fatal disease back in those days but it was part of their armamentarium. Among the things that we still use today, we have things like ALO. I'm willing to bet that in this audience, someone has uh, suffered a mosquito bite or a burn, gone out to their garden, sliced off an ALO leaf, and squeezed the juice of that ALO onto the burn, and the pain disappears immediately. And I can testify to that because I have done this and we are still using that. In fact, if you go to uh, a pharmacy today or a cosmetics counter, ALO is still a very common ingredient. I mentioned honey in the treatment of wounds. We still use that. One example that I remember from my days in medical school, I don't think that they're using it now, probably not, but back then, uh, bed sores were common. Of course, bed sores today are a no-no. If your patient gets bed sores, you are in deep trouble. The bed sores were not uncommon 60 years ago when I was uh, uh, early in my medical practice. 
And at that time, we would take ordinary table sugar and pour it into the vessel, cover it, and then change that dressing every day because bacteria will not grow in a bed of sugar or in honey uh, because of the nature of that material. Well, they knew about opium back in those days, and of course, we're still using opium today. Uh, it wasn't until the middle of the last century that we stopped using castor oil as a laxative. We have better things now, but castor oil was a very strong laxative, often caused cramping, uh, which caused uh, a lot of uh, mothers to complain about the laxatives for their kids. But castor oil is also to be used in various food products as a stabilizer. It's used in some medical products as well because of the chemical nature. Well, let's see what a day in the life of a physician was like in ancient Egypt. One of his patients walked in, this was a 30 year old scribe, and he uh, pointed out that he, when he uh, had passed the stool, something caught his eye, there's something moving in that stool. And of course, Imhotep knew right away that it's likely to be a tapeworm. Tapeworms are extremely common in developing countries, certainly are a part of civilization until just a, really a few decades ago. And the treatment was pomegranate root. And apparently there is something in pomegranate root which paralyzes the worm. And the worm simply lets go and is passed out with the next bowel movement. Well, primitive cultures, because of their poor hygiene and public health facilities, had a lot of parasites. And the incidence of parasite uh, infestation is literally 100% in most of the developing world. I experienced this myself when I was stationed in Puerto Rico and I made a, a call to the infectious disease specialist at, at the medical school at the university in Puerto Rico. And we, were, we got to talk about parasites and I said, what percentage of Puerto Ricans have parasites? And she said, well, doctor, let me tell you, when one of our technicians examines a stool specimen for parasites and doesn't find anything, the technician will ask for another specimen because he must have made a mistake. Because all of our patients have parasites. Now that's changed to some degree. Yes, our hygiene has gotten better, but Poor sanitation means constant contamination of soil and water. And in fact, we have actually gotten along pretty well with parasites because some parasites could not exist very well without humans and other animals, uh, which maintain part of their life cycle. But it's not all bad because what we find is that just like there are bacterial probiotics, there are parasite probiotics because humans and microbes evolve together and we began to need each other. And just as bacteria are the best studied probiotics, viruses and parasites probably have similar beneficial uh, functions as well. Uh, if we look at what they do, is one thing that they do is contribute to immune function. And without a healthy concentration of what are called the good bacteria or normal flora or probiotics in your intestine, your immune system wouldn't be as robust. What we have, for example, found is we can treat the disease called ulcerative colitis with giving those patients a cocktail that contains the eggs of the pig whipworm. And I know that sounds pretty gross, but it just shows how important it is for certain systems of ours to rely on parasites that we have pretty much done away with because we have such good hygiene. Another disease that Egyptian physicians commonly saw in those days was something called schistosoma. There are two kinds of schistosoma parasites. One involves the large intestine and the other involves the bladder. And in both cases, they can spread to other organs where they can cause damage by obstructing blood vessels, for instance. Even today, the current prevalence of, of excuse me, what is called schistosomiasis is 10 to 15%. It is no small problem. And again, back then, if you were diagnosed with this disease, you would be given a prescription that included the tail of a mouse, 
and the uh, little bit of onion and some uh, uh, wheat meal, some honey and water, strain this and drink it several times a day for four days. Now, I have no idea why it might work. It's pretty unlikely that it would, but it, uh, it paid the bills. There has been a problem that has occurred for a long time. Uh, and back in the days of ancient Egypt and even now, and as I mentioned, this is the bladder schistosomiasis, which is characterized by this patient. This was a 12-year-old boy who came in complaining of blood in his urine and discomfort when he passed urine. And it was, it's very common that this occurs in children who play in fresh water. And the, one of the life stages of the schistosoma, called schistosoma hematobium, uh, is a form which can penetrate the skin goes under further development within the body, one symptom of which is a widespread skin rash. And the worm then migrates to the bladder and takes up residence in the wall of the bladder, where every once in a while it erodes the uh, lining of the bladder, causing some bleeding to occur and some irritability on urination. That's what that child presents with. And we know that it occurred back in the ancient Egyptian period because we know that those eggs were found in mummies. The treatment at that time was curcumin, which I think is kind of interesting because as you probably know, curcumin is one of those spices and antioxidants that is being uh, promoted these days to help uh, to uh, cure or to prevent heart disease and cancer. Well, as I mentioned, this condition is still present in modern Egypt. That's something that every Egyptian physician is aware of. Well, this figure of a young person in Egypt shows a disease which has been fairly common throughout history. And what I'm talking about is polio. And I said it's probable polio because we can't be certain because there are other conditions, even injuries, which can cause the wasting of a leg, an improperly set fracture, uh, an infection from the kind of a wasting of a limb in two art. And it's also been found in mummies. And the virus that causes polio is commonly found in sewage. It's part of a family of viruses called enteroviruses, and this particular enterovirus, the polio virus, is not benign. It can cause some serious problems. But again, not everybody who is infected with the polio virus can become ill. As a matter of fact, only about one person out of 200 who acquires a virus will begin to have any symptoms whatsoever. And even fewer have paralysis. And as I pointed out, those wasted limbs may have had other causes as well, even something like a birth defect or a birth injury. Another disease that uh, he probably saw was one like this, a seven-year-old child brought in because the mother noted that this child had a tremendous appetite, couldn't be uh, kept away from the, uh, the, uh, the pantry, but was continuing to, to lose weight. And also that he uh, had stopped wetting the bed when he was about two or three years old. However, he started wetting the bed again and she also noted that this poor kid was drinking like crazy and putting out a lot of urine. And what Inhotep did, he gathered a little bit of this urine and he tasted it, which by the way, was something that doctors did until about the middle or the end of the 19th century. But to him, it tasted sweet. And he made the diagnosis of type one diabetes. Type 1 diabetes has been present for a very long time. It is uh, one of those things that has a particular genetic predisposition, and it occurs when the pancreas is entirely unable for a variety of reasons, usually because of some infection by a virus. The pancreas stops producing insulin. Without insulin, life cannot continue for very long. Usually those kids die within a couple of months, almost never live for as long as a year. We didn't cure that disease until the 1920s when insulin was discovered. 
Well, back in that desert area, they had a lot of a disease called pneumoconiosis. And that's because there was uh, blown sand in the atmosphere pretty much most of the year. And because some of those particles of sand got into the lungs, they caused inflammation and scarring in the structure of that tissue, they ended up with a condition which we now know among coal miners as black lung disease. They also began to have some tuberculosis, uh, although as I mentioned, it was pretty hard to confirm that from mummies because we didn't see the lungs and the lungs didn't preserve that tissue. But probably tuberculosis that we see today in, in lung form migrated from cattle to humans with a genetic change at the start of the agriculture revolution about 10 or 12,000 years ago. And until the middle of the last century, tuberculosis was very common. In fact, in the 19th century, tuberculosis was the single most common cause of death among both adults and children. And isn't it interesting that we put up with it for all that time? The first antibiotic for tuberculosis wasn't discovered until 1946. Now, the, that first antibiotic was under streptomycin, and most TB germs are now resistant to that. We now have several different types of antibiotics for tuberculosis, but the TB germs seem to be outwitting us. There are some TB germs that are resistant to almost every particular uh, type of antibiotic that we have for that disease. And we may be seeing more of that in the future if these strains, which are not very common in this country, but are common in developing countries spread around the globe. Well, as you can imagine, if you live in a primitive world, bites are fairly common. Scorpion bites, we know, we have those in San Diego. Crocodile bites uh, still occur, and people are killed in Florida every now and then by, by alligators, uh, which is a kind of a crocodile. And of course, there are several types of poisonous snakes in Egypt, the treatment of which is a mixture of onions and salt and beer. And I'm sure everyone knows the story about Cleopatra, who is said to have committed suicide by allowing a, an asp, a particularly venomous type of adder that occurs in uh, Egypt. And there are some interesting stories about Cleopatra about different kinds of poison snakes, probably among her slaves, to tell which one would get the job done quickly and without too much pain. Well, they did some surgery back though in those days. We know that uh, they did circumcisions. This was a ritual at puberty. And one of the theories is that because they lived in the desert area, with, with uh, blowing sand all around, it simply made, made the organ easier to clean if there was no skin that would hold contaminated sand underneath it to cause infection. And of course, if uh, someone were unlucky enough to have a severe injury to an arm or leg, they might need an amputation or amputation might occur during the course of warfare or an accident. However, it's not likely that many people survived amputation. I mentioned uh, they knew how to raise the skull fracture. Another thing that they did was to do trephination, which is literally to bore a hole in the skull to let out the evil uh, spirits. Of course, they had no underlying biological knowledge of what they were doing. Uh, they didn't do it because of medical indication, but someone, for instance, who might have convulsion uh, might be subject to that. And we know sometimes those people survive because the edges of the hole they made in the skin show pretty good healing uh, that uh, had to take at least several months. And so some of those surgical procedures, the first neurosurgeons probably did okay. I mentioned also that they uh, were among the earliest to do bone setting. They were pretty good at that. And they were good at treating war wounds because they always had those problems to contend with. Well, there were dentists back in those days too. I can imagine what those tools must have been like. But because of the fact that they used sand in the grinding of grain, and sand pretty much got into everything, including any of their foods, uh, the, uh, their teeth showed excessive tooth wear, which led to things like abscesses. And without antibiotics and without proper surgical procedures, those abscesses could be fatal. What we find is that there were certain kinds of procedures that allowed them to 
to fill teeth. Some of those actually were done uh, after the person died, uh, but they still have some of that technology. If a person had false teeth, those false teeth were usually placed after death. I have no idea why they felt that was important, but I guess if you thought you were going to come back to life, you needed a good set of teeth to enjoy the food that they stored with you in your tomb. This, for an example, is a, a bridge of the two central uh, lower incisors. And we know that this particular bridge was constructed after the person had lost those teeth sometime earlier because the lower portion of that socket, that uh, those pair of sockets is smooth and rounded, which meant uh, some healing had occurred, but they sure made a good looking corpse. Would you believe that they use things like breath mints, my gosh. They made those pellets from things like frankincense and myrrh, cinnamon and honey. They also had some evidence of uh, heart disease, which is kind of surprising because it was felt that in those, among those people where obesity, as I pointed out earlier, was, was very low, they still had, had atherosclerosis. Uh, they didn't have uh, very much meat in that society or fat or sugar, but they had heart disease anyway. Probably this was noted among mummies more than any other people because the mummies were uh, reserved for people of higher caste and they probably had a better diet, which in those days, just like it is now, it has a lot of fat and sugar. It's noted, however, that cancer was very uncommon in, in mummies. Now, maybe we don't know much about it because the soft tissues are not very well preserved. Would you believe that they even had a pregnancy test back then? And the way they did it was this. They would take a couple of uh, small boxes of um, soil and they would plant them with grain, which was either emmer wheat or barley. And the woman would urinate several times a day on those two patches of grain. And if either one of those grains grew, she was pregnant. And if it, only the barley sprouted, it would be a boy. And if only the ember sprout, it would be a girl. Now, that's interesting kind of folk tale, isn't it? However, two of the students tested this in 1963, and it turns out they had a reliability of 70%. So clearly the Egyptians knew something. The medical legacy was quite uh, extensive even though much of their practices uh, were uh, based on religious concepts and, and had nothing to do with biology, of which they had almost no knowledge. And finally, when physicians from Greece and Rome came to Egypt, uh, the Egyptian physicians were replaced by better ideas and better tested uh, medical theories. And even though they uh, should have had a good knowledge of anatomy, actually most physicians of the day did not. However, their knowledge of herbs was not unique. If you go to any uh, primitive culture, you'll find that the medicine people, medicine per person, the shamans, knew a great deal about how effective herbs can be in the treatment of various kinds of conditions. But except for Imhotep, who is a, what, eventually a, a religious deity, there were no medical leaders of lasting influence as Hippocrates was in Greece or Galen was in Rome or the ones that we've seen since then. One of their theories about diseases was the channel theory. And because they knew how water worked, because of the way they needed to irrigate their fields and diverting the Nile in various ways, they noted what happens when one of those channels become obstructed. And they thought, well, when some of the channels of the body became obstructed, that led to disease as well. And they knew that there were channels for air, the lungs, uh, channels for water, uh, the kidneys, and channels for blood, the blood system. And they also knew that if you blocked one of those channels, disease would follow. Because of their primitive knowledge and their the channel theory, they used things to open things up, like laxatives and purgatives and bleeding. And clearly those things had no real effect, but I guess it made them feel like they were doing something. The Egyptians at that period were absolute geniuses, as, as we all know. Their knowledge of mathematics 
was simply astounding. There, and when they matched that knowledge of mathematics with astronomy and architecture and engineering, they came up with the pyramids that are really remarkable for the integration of those sciences. This, for instance, shows a, a cross-section of one of the uh, Egyptian pyramids. In the center is a king's chamber, below that is a queen's chamber, and then there was a grand gallery, and you, uh, you enter this from the lower right, as you can see. And something that is not obvious from this slide is that there was also a special chamber well below the base. And it's really hard to imagine how they had this 3D vision uh, architect, this architectural scheme that would allow them to construct something like this with such incredible uh, precision. If you want to find out exactly how precise the, the pyramids were put together, then if you go simply Google um, theories of the origin of the Egyptian pyramids, and uh, there, is, um, uh, there are several theories, some of them are really wacky, uh, but there are some that really kind of make sense, and one in particular uh, by a, uh, a, 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 I believe he's a physicist, and I think his last name is Hancock, and he describes how precise those passageways were and how precise the orientation of the py pyramids, all the pyramids, uh, uh, was, was done in order to take advantage of the, uh, the summer solstice and the precise direction of the rays of the sun is absolutely fascinating. And finally, one of the slaves tells another slave, the Pharaoh's final request was to be buried with his cat. And the cat says, woof. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, Dr. Goshensky, for your illuminating and engaging presentation. So my name is Dante Ferenga from the San Diego Archaeological Center, and I will be moderating questions. Just as a reminder, you can type your questions into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So I will start with one of our first questions. Were there many female physicians in ancient Egypt besides the midwives? There is some evidence uh, that there were uh, female physicians. Again, you can Google uh, ancient Egyptian female physicians, and there is one particular one. Uh, I can't remember her name right now, but she has uh, been described uh, extensively and was apparently highly revered by her peers, even though even back in those days, as um, recently, female physicians do come again, up against some discrimination. Uh, but she had a wide following and is quite well known to people who study um, ancient uh, Egyptian medicine. So the answer is yes, there were some f female physicians in ancient Egypt, probably not very many, and maybe the reason she became so popular was because she was so unique. And another question that a couple people have asked is what type of anesthesia was used for surgery, if any? Well, more than likely they use some morphine type of anesthesia. Morphine has been used as an anesthetic uh, literally for millennia. It uh, was used very extensively, for instance, in the uh, gold, during the gold rush period in California because Modern anesthesia only began in the middle uh, 1840s, 1846, 1847. And the word didn't get spread around the medical community for a couple of years, a few years after that. And up until that time, uh, morphine, alcohol, and a, an herb called henbane were very commonly used uh, for anesthesia. Also, people have known that cocaine is a very potent topical anesthetic. You may know that one of the complications of heavy cocaine use is that the lining of the nose becomes um, distorted and scarred and ulcerated and the nasal septum actually can sometimes dissolve. Well when I was a young teenager uh, 
I was uh, plagued by sinus problems and spent a lot of time uh, in the office of an ENT surgeon. And he would actually take a long copper wire with cotton at the end, dip it in cocaine, and put it back through my nose to anesthetize my nose so that he could then literally break an opening to a plug, a, a, uh, an obstructive sinus. And it was very effective because although uh, that wire going through my nose didn't feel very good, I did not have any pain when he literally poked a hole in the bone in the floor of the sinus. So again, cocaine was something that, that they may have been used in that time, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the coca plant, of course, now is prevalent in South America. I really don't know enough body to know whether something like a uh, coca plant was present in other parts of the world. And we have a question from Melissa Usher asking, do we have any knowledge on mental health issue identification and attempts to treat those? Mental health issues. They probably thought that mental disorders were a curse of the gods. And that kind of thinking didn't really go away until just a couple of hundred years ago. Um, and something like epilepsy was felt to be possession by the devil. The accounts in the Bible or other ancient writings of, of uh, possession by a devil uh, are perfectly, uh, this, uh, perfectly matched symptoms of grand mal seizures. Uh, and there are other forms of epilepsy which cause the person uh, to utter uh, curses, as an example. Uh, there are medical conditions uh, which cause people to come out with strings of uh, vulgar uh, phrases and words. Uh, and, and as you can imagine, they, we didn't know what brain anatomy was like, what diseases were like a couple thousand years ago. So it was simply blamed on evil spirits or punishment by the gods. But to answer the question, yes, they, they were mental disorders, but they didn't consider them to be medical type problems. We have a question from Adriana Tamayo. How do they treat chest pain since many mummies and CT scans show blockages of the left main and left co uh, coronary? That's interesting. I bet they didn't have anything to treat uh, coronary obstruction with. Uh, as a matter of fact, we didn't have anything to treat that with until fairly recently. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a little puzzled by this issue of coronary artery disease in ancient Egypt. Because if we look back even in this country and in Europe, a couple hundred years, coronary artery disease was not very common. Now, heart disease was uh, and has been for, for centuries. But even 100 years ago, uh, the main causes of heart disease, especially cardiac-related death, were things like rheumatic fever and syphilis. And the, as a matter of fact, the first case of what we now know as a classic heart attack, a myocardial infarction, was not published in the medical literature until 1912. Another example is uh, Paul Dudley White, who was the cardiologist, uh, Dwight Eisenhower, very well-known uh, physician, began his medical uh, clerkship uh, and hospital experience in 1912 kept a, a, a log of his, his patients on an all-male medical ward for two years, and among several hundred patients, including many with heart disease, he only had one patient with what we consider a classic myocardial infarction or heart attack. And if you go to any major hospital today, if you look at 800 patients, you have got literally scores of them, in fact, most of them, have had have coronary artery disease because we have literally eliminated rheumatic fever and syphilis <clears throat> uh, and congenital heart defects uh, as causes of death. Uh, again, there was something very peculiar about that society, and I think that it may have been due to a genetic uh, factor. And the reason I say that is that in some parts of northern Italy, there are clusters of people with a, a congenital uh, genetic defect, 
that produces very high levels of cholesterol and uh, high, high incidence of blockage of the coronary arteries. And it may be that there was something like that going on in Egypt at, <clears throat> at the time. And again, we, didn't, we, we, we can't have a cross-section of all Egyptians uh, 3,500 years ago. We only have a cross-section through mummy studies of the aristocracy. And because of the inbreeding, that may have increased the risk of a genetic factor which led to coronary artery disease, artery disease. So even people with that defect, even if they modify their diet and have what we consider a healthy diet, they get heart attacks anyway. And again, more likely to have occurred among the aristocracy than among the peasantry. And then a question from Catherine Mulder. Are there any published descriptions of how exactly the herbs and medicines used by ancient Egyptian physicians were used? How, what kind of medications? Or how the herbs and medicines were used. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh, the papyri that I, I mentioned, the Eberus and the Smith papyrus, uh, describe various uh, treatments and they actually describe how those preparations were made. So yeah, there's a fair amount of information of how they uh, produced those. Um, keep in mind that it wasn't until about the uh, 1930s or so that we began to use medications that were not derived from plants. Uh, the first heart medication, digitalis, is derived from a plant. The first anti-leukemia drugs were derived from plants. And so that most of what the physician had in his or her armamentarium before the middle of the 20th century was plant-based. And if you look at studies that were done uh, of uh, the, uh, the group that I mentioned, physicians during the California Gold Rush, much of their armamentarium was plant-based. Henbane for anesthesia, as an example, comes from a plant. Uh, morphine, of course, comes from a plant, a poppy. And there were a number of other preparations that were used. Garlic was a common one. Onion was a common one. But again, all plant-based. Uh, so we have literally libraries filled with information about how early physicians used various kinds of herbs. I was on an airplane one time uh, and coming back from a, me a medical conference and I what my, my seatmate was a woman who is a, was a plant pharmacologist and she actually sp specialized in her research on medications derived from plants. And she says, think about this. She said, the reason why many primitive peoples have knowledge of very effective plant-based medicines is because they had nothing else to do. They had a lot of time for trial and error and but within a few generations, certainly over hundreds of generations, they learned what plants worked and what plants didn't. And so there was a very large body of knowledge throughout history of the effectiveness of, uh, of plants. We have a question from Katrina Kirchhoff, who says, thank you for your fantastic lecture. Thank Would you, you. Think that the prevalence of lead in cosmetics and art could have been a contributing factor to the amount of cancer in mummies? Is there a class distinction between prevalence of cancer in individuals? That's interesting. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, if uh, if lead, lead is used, then it, uh, it can affect, uh, for instance, um, the kidneys, uh, and the brain. And we don't have any way of knowing what that might have been like because we didn't preserve those tissues from three or four thousand years ago. We do know that lead poisoning was common uh, throughout uh, history. Uh, some of the cosmetics, uh, as you alluded to, uh, in Greece and Rome had lead-based pigment. And I suppose that if a woman were to use a lead-based pigment on her skin, 
day after day, year after year, enough would be uh, absorbed to cause problems. However, I'm not aware that lead causes cancer. Uh, I just haven't ever looked at that uh, because lead is something that can cause uh, severe anemia. And we used to see this a lot when I was a medical student in Jersey City. Uh, kids would get poisoned from the paint chips that they would pick off window sills and uh, come in with uh, kidney damage, brain damage, uh, and severe anemia. Um, in fact, I, I lost a couple of uh, children who came in in coma and didn't survive for more than a few hours because they had ingested enough lead from a, a few paint chips uh, to cause that severe damage. So I would think that one of the <clears throat> problems of lead is brain damage. In fact, uh, you may know that lead piping was used throughout Rome a couple of thousand years ago. And there has been a theory that the reason there were so many uh, absolutely nutty, insane emperors in Rome was because they drank from lead vessels. They drank wine. Wine is slightly acidic and a slightly acidic liquid will actually dissolve some lead from vessels and, uh, and, and cause brain damage, one of which is, uh, is uh, a severe kind of dementia. Uh, and these, it may be that uh, that's the reason that, that really does explain uh, brain damage. But again, I'm not aware of an associate between lead and cancer. Uh, it causes so many more obvious problems. And cancers usually take a long time to develop. Uh, kidney disease, uh, brain disease, not so long. We have a question from Linda Colson. How are physicians paid? Do people make a living at treating other people? Ah, good question. I don't know the answer to that. But over the years, uh, some physicians became quite wealthy because they had a wide following, especially among the aristocracy. Uh, you're probably aware uh, that uh, many leaders throughout, the, uh, throughout history have had personal, uh, personal physicians uh, who were the palace physician or the emperor's physician. And uh, even people like Napoleon had their own physicians. Uh, <clears throat> when it came to the treatment of the more common people, what the Greeks call the hoi polloi, uh, they probably charged fees as they had their own families to support. Uh, we've all heard the tales of uh, physicians in this country being paid off by farmers with uh, things like chickens and pigs and, and, uh, and eggs, uh, and that has occurred. Uh, I have encountered that myself. Um, I have occasionally over the years uh, um, done some of the medical favor and received uh, something like a dessert or uh, uh, in one case a very nice knitted sweater, and I'm sure that kind of thing happened. Uh, back in the days of Egypt, I would assume that they really didn't have very much of a currency among the, say, the middle class. Uh, ways of paying their physicians and precious stones or precious metals, uh, jewelry, that kind of thing. So yeah, I, I think that physicians were fairly well compensated. You have to consider though that many of the great physicians over the uh, centuries uh, have been uh, in monasteries and of course, they didn't charge the people who came to them because they were cared for by the monastic order. And so in that sense, uh, they were paid. And so maybe not in any kind of luxury, but they had a probably a pretty good life. We have another question. What was the role of priests in medicine? What was the role of priests in medicine? My feeling is that a lot of the physicians of the time acted as priests because much of the practice of medicine in those days was based on religion and not on biology. And I haven't seen descriptions of Egyptian physicians as priests, but much of what they did had a religious feature. And so even without being called priests, that's pretty much what they were. Um, because the advice they gave, even in their public health practices, as I mentioned, uh, 
were, were proposed as religious decrees and not simply as medical advice. So my feeling is that we have to think of them as physician priests or priest physicians. And we have another question from Linda. Was wine too expensive for the general populace in ancient Egypt? Beer is usually referenced as the drink of choice. <laughs> well, I'm willing to bet that they had a two buck truck back then too. And I'm sure that uh, wine was a common beverage. We know that beer was a common beverage uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, beer, was, uh, beer came along probably well before wine did. Probably there were many, many sources of uh, both those beverages among the general population. And certainly when it came to aristocracy, I'm sure they had their own wineries. Um, but think about this. They probably knew back then that beer and wine were safer to drink than water. And it's an excuse that has been used through the centuries but it's not so far off. When you realize that in any primitive culture, unless they have a very well-designed system that can separate sewage from their drinking water supply, then gastrointestinal diseases are very common. The most famous one probably being the cholera epidemic uh, that occurred in, um, I can't think of the time, but maybe early 1800s. Um, uh, and it was, uh, discovered by a physician named Dr. John Snow, who realized that, that the great number of cholera cases that he saw seemed to be spread in a, uh, from a central point. The central point was a particular source of water called the Broad Street Pump. And legend has it, not quite accurate, but the legend is that John Snow brought an end to the cholera epidemic by taking the handle off the Broad Street pump. And people had to go to other pumps throughout the city to get their water. Those pumps were not contaminated. And it was later found that there was in fact a direct connection between the sewage disposal system and the water source of the Broad Street pump. And that's why they had that cholera breakout at that time and why other sources of water throughout the city didn't have the same bad reputation. Uh, but it may be that things like that, uh, the recognition that water caused disease made people drink more things like wine and, and beer. Now, when it comes to the antibacterial activity of wine, it is not so great. Alcohol has an undeserved reputation for killing germs. It had, is somewhat effective, if you're reading much about the coronavirus epidemic, you've probably read about some of the studies that show that a, uh, a, a concentration of alcohol between 20 and 40 percent and certainly 60 percent will kill of the, of the virus. However, uh, alcohol is not a really great disinfectant for all germs. As an example, when I was doing some research on a particular group of organisms um, during my fellowship, uh, one of the things that I added to the medium to help some of those germs grow better was alcohol. It was called phenyl ethyl alcohol medium, and those germs grew better when alcohol was added to, their, to the medium in which they grew. So uh, again, <clears throat> alcohol has certain uses. Uh, if you need an excuse to drink a glass of wine or two before dinner to prevent the coronavirus, have had it. And I think we have time for one or two more questions. Now I have one from Gregory Meesier. What evidence is there of malpractice? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, I'm sure there was malpractice because there was no good practice. Um, certainly some physicians were punished with death or the loss of a, of a hand, for instance, if they were treating the king or part of the family and the, and the royal family and things didn't turn out well, 
And we know from history that sometimes physicians were literally uh, killed as a result of that. Uh, there was no financial incentive for malpractice because there were probably no attorneys back in, in ancient Egypt. Take away the attorneys and you take away the malpractice. Now that may be, seem like a kind of a cruel and snide remark, but the fact is, uh, and, and you can see this from TV ads, uh, that uh, people can blame various uh, things, uh, various conditions on poor medical care when it is either uh, not proven, as in the case of uh, things like um, uh, ovarian cancer, for instance, which is still going through the courts, uh, certain other conditions uh, which may not be recognized for literally for decades. We didn't realize, for instance, how harmful asbestos was for decades, but now people are being uh, are going to court to, to fight companies that made asbestos. And when it comes to malpractice in ancient uh, times, if things didn't turn out, I'm not sure that the physician was blamed very often because uh, the death occurred so frequently, infections were so common, uh, life uh, expectancy was so low uh, that I think that people realized that there were some things that a physician just couldn't do. That hasn't changed, by the way. One of the great frustrations of my career is, is losing children due to certain viral conditions because there was no treatment, no antiviral medication that could keep us from losing them. And so in that sense, there has always been this inevitability that bad things happen and there's some diseases that will occur and no one has control of them. Great, I think we have time for one final question. This is another question from Katrina. She says, she, I noticed that earlier you had drawn her attention to the fact that obesity made no appearance in the portraiture you presented, which reminded me of a little bit of a debate I've come across a few times. Some people argue that the portraiture does not faithfully represent the actual physique of royalty on the argument that royals were, far more, were likely far more sedentary than the common laborer, maintained a tradition of inbreeding to maintain royal lineage, as you mentioned, and the pressure to maintain the image of godliness. There's also discussion that famous figures such as Nefertiti had developed diabetes with appendages removed. Is there evidence that diabetes may have been more prevalent with the upper classes? Was diabetes more prevalent with the upper classes? Diabetes um, is largely a disease caused by the lack of exercise. That's a prime factor. And the lack of exercise leads to obesity. And as I pointed out, obesity was very uncommon in all the depictions of people who lived in that time. I am not aware of a single mummy that has been described as being obese. Now, did they get diabetes? Possibly they might have gotten diabetes for the same reason they got, they got uh, heart disease, coronary artery disease, because we know that type one disease has a very strong genetic component Type 2 disease, uh, diabetes, which is an entirely different kind of diabetes, also has some degree of... And the thing that makes a difference, however, is lifestyle. And this has been kind of one of my themes ever since I began giving presentations about 25 years ago, that all of us have the genes that predispose us to things like obesity and diabetes. However, if we maintain a healthy lifestyle, those genes don't become expressed. As an example, about 90% of people with type 2 diabetes are either overweight or obese. And of the 10% who appear to be of normal weight, many of them, not all because there are, other, there are exceptions, but many of those so-called normal weight people are in fact what are called normal weight obese, NWO, normal weight obese, that's a medical term. Because even though their, their weight, their body weight is normal for their height according to standard uh, uh, life tables, the percentage of body fat is higher than it's supposed to be. And that higher percentage of body fat is what leads to diseases like type two diabetes and coronary artery disease and, and stroke and cancer. Obesity by itself, uh, it has a direct effect on 14 different types of cancer. So uh, again, 
it's hard to really un unravel what kind of medical conditions occurred among the royalty in Egypt because of the inbreeding that I uh, mentioned. And ordinarily, genetic traits that may have been suppressed, if there is a dispersion uh, of genes and adequate mixing of genetic material, when you don't mix the genes and they tend to congregate uh, among a certain group of people, then the incidence of certain diseases, certain diseases like congenital heart disease, for instance, a cleft palate, uh, are an example. And as I mentioned, King Tut had a, a partial cleft palate. And we know that does have some strong genetic uh, factors involved. So because we really don't know what their genetics were like, it's hard to really say what sort of processes in their lifestyle led to those diseases because it, it's not, it was not a normal population. In other words, if you looked at a thousand Egyptian royalty and compared, to, uh, compared them to a thousand Southern Californians, there would be no resemblance between those two groups. You could not possibly uh, compare one with another. All right, we're actually going to do one more question before okay. we wrap it up. James Bryant asks, the Ro did the Romans use lead oxide to flavor sour wine? Did the Romans use lead oxide to flavor sour wine? I don't know. I, uh, I like wine, but I'm not an expert on wine. <clears throat> um, I do know some interesting stories about wine, but lead oxide is not one of them. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Goshinsky, for tonight's talk, and thank you everyone who attended tonight's Living Room Lecture.